The most immediate flashpoint in Asia right now is not Taiwan, it's Japan. You have repeated incursions by China into Japanese territory. We have seen Chinese lock their radars onto unarmed Japanese craft. We also see them verbally attacking the Japanese on almost a daily basis. Relations between China and Japan are perhaps at an all-time low. Anything associated with Japan, from sushi shops to factories to Japanese brand cars, was under siege. It gets ugly very fast. I'm Peter Navarro, and in this episode of Crouching Tiger, we're going to look at the increasingly contentious China-Japan relationship as a possible trigger for war. A war that may well drag the United States into the conflict because of its long-term commitment to defend Japan in the event of attack. And therein lies the crouching tiger tale. Today, Japan and China have an annual trade of about $345 billion. It's tremendous. In terms of foreign direct investment, the Japanese are the second or third largest investors. These are two countries that have extremely important trade and investment relations, and where China arguably benefits more than Japan in certain respects. That hasn't prevented the Chinese from uh, taking steps that raise the risk of conflict with Japan, and which may in the long run dissuade Japanese companies from investing in China and so on. The Chinese demonstration to Japan of its intentions of late has been on the side of they want to be a regional hegemon, they want to refuse the Japanese dialogue, and they are just going to behave the way they want to. China engages in very provocative military behavior. Its vessels intrude into Japanese waters. What you see is a clear progression on the part of the Chinese. It is creeping coerciveness that goes along a spectrum, and that is something that our friends who deal with it in Asia are very, very sensitive to and very aware of. In Washington, I think, they, they don't pay as much attention. If you're in Japan or even if you're in Vietnam, you face the prospects of, of Chinese missiles uh, that, can, that can hit you because they're within range every day. So every time you're sitting down and negotiating with the Chinese, you, you have a, a gun to your head. Uh, so coercion is already going on today. In January 2014, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said that his relationship with China resembled that between England and Germany in 1914. A month later, Philippine President Benigno Aquino said that the West policies towards China resembled those in 1938, specifically referring to the Sudetenland. I'm not saying that the People's Republic of China is the same as the Third Reich. Of course it isn't but the dynamic that we are seeing today resembles earlier periods. Now, if you flip it around and you talk to chi Chinese experts, they will immediately go back to the Japanese cultural proclivity for militarism. They'll go back to World War II. They'll talk about the Japanese. They'll talk about Mr. Abe going to Yasukuni Shrine, and they'll talk about Japanese nationalism. So there's two parts of the puzzle here, which is how do you accommodate a rising power? And to a large extent, Japan is struggling with that. Right? Um, it's moving from this kind of very sort of special relationship with China to, uh-oh, maybe it's not going to be a continued close bilateral special relationship anymore. Um, and they're not quite sure what to do about it. China's treatment of Japan doesn't make a lot of sense from the perspective of China's long-term strategic interests. It would make more sense in kind of cool, rational uh, calculation for China to try to improve its relations with Japan, to try to draw Japan perhaps out of the orbit of the United States and establish it as a closer partner and maybe a dependent on China. Uh, that isn't going to happen. Any chance that that would happen or could have happened, I think, was done away with in the last four or five years by these crises and increased tensions between China and Japan, which have caused people in Japan to become deeply fearful about China's intentions. The point is that China is engaging in tactics that the law of averages says at one point there will be an incident, and that incident could spiral out of control. China is certainly not the only country in Asia engaged in a rapid military buildup. Japan, for its part, is attempting to heavily rearm itself for the first time since the end of World War II. This next question and clue in our detective story, we explore the underlying motivations for this buildup. 
when we talk about the present relationship, which is so fraught with tension, it's worth considering that it hasn't always been this way. It doesn't have to be this way. So Japan normalized its relationship with China, with the People's Republic of China in 1978. So Japan began its post-war diplomacy really after the Nixon opening to China. Japan was a U.S. ally, so it followed the lead of the United States in terms of its relationships with China. But inside Japan, the debate was really about reconciliation with this country that they'd been at war with in World War II. And the strategy that the Japanese had for reconciliation in post-war Japan-China with Japan -China relations was economic. We have to remember that during the time of Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, the first two rulers of the People's Republic, China had very good relations with Japan. Deng Xiaoping looked to Japan as a model for Chinese modernization. That's because Mao and Deng were strongmen. They didn't need to demonize Japan in order to bolster their political position back home. The strategy over time was, was, was actually quite effective for the Japanese and for the Chinese. Japan gave, along with the Chinese five-year plan, significant uh, economic development. Most of the infrastructure that China built over the course of the 1980s was really built with Japanese uh, help and assistance. And for a while, the, the bilateral relationship between Japan and China was really quite smooth. But after Deng, we've seen a succession now of three weaker leaders who have made Japan an enemy in order to bolster their political position back home. And they're trying to portray Japan as, a, as, as it was during the militaristic period of World War II. But this is a portrayal that Princeton scholar Aaron Friedberg clearly takes exception to. The idea that lurking behind the mask of Prime Minister Abe is Hirohito is an illusion. Japan is a defensive country. Uh, it's a country that doesn't have uh, territorial claims on China. It's a country with a an aging and dwindling population whose economy is not growing nearly as rapidly as it once was. The Chinese, I think, don't appreciate the influence they are having on the perceptions, not of the elite in Japan, but the perceptions on the in part of the Japanese public. Because Beijing has continually provoked the Japanese, we are now seeing the reaction, and the inevitable reaction, the natural reaction in Japan. We are seeing the Japanese realizing they got to defend themselves. The fact that the Chinese and Japanese governments can't together devise problem-solving kinds of solutions to a variety of policy challenges that are resulting from Chinese influence, right? Um, that instead then allows the Japanese public to be much more fearful about what China's ultimate intentions are and about the capacity of their own government to cope. So the, the, the advocacy in Japan is not necessarily just anti-China. It's really, we want a stronger government. We and a want stronger a, military. We want a more forceful government that will stand up to China. So what we're seeing in Japan today is the natural reaction to Chinese aggressiveness. Not all of our experts, however, see China's military buildup as benignly defensive in nature, nor China's political leaders as the only ones to blame for rising tensions. I think we have to ask some hard questions about our uh, allies, our friends, the Japanese, under Prime Minister Abe. That is seeking to change the Constitution to uh, allow unlimited militarization. The fact of the matter is he's done things that are deeply troubling, not only to Chinese, but South Koreans, which are our allies, and indeed many Americans. The fact that we again find ourselves supporting a regime uh, uh, which basically uh, has a uh, uh, promoting uh, e extreme nationalism, which now changed the textbooks to whitewash uh, what it did to China uh, during uh, World War II. Uh, the whole issue of uh, the treatment of women by the Japanese Imperial Army, uh, he, Abe has gone some distance to a kind of downplay. He's even questioned whether World War II was an example of Japanese aggression or not, questioned what the meaning of aggression is. And this is where Mr. Abe, I think, has brought, unfortunately, has brought some difficulty to the conversation. And that is they're struggling a lot with, with Chinese criticism of their views of history. Germany uh, came clean about its past. It confronted it, it teaching in its schools and its military, never again. Japan does just the opposite. They not only are not willing to walk away from their crimes, 
uh, but they're walking away from the very meager apologies they made. Sure, I'm all for having a conversation about Asia's past if, if, uh, if people in the region thinks that it's, thinks that it's uh, necessary. I, and this is by no means uh, meant to suggest that Japan should get a free pass because what it did is certainly horrendous, occupying Manchuria and big swaths of China in the 30s and 40s in particular. No one excuses that, and nor, nor should we. And I hope that I hope that the Japanese are not uh, trying to get out of responsibility. Some once in a while they say things that make that make you think they might be. Uh, but at the same time, I think that if we're going to have a, a candid conversation about uh, about who abused the Chinese people in the 20th century, you can't ignore the biggest abuser of the Chinese people in the 20th century, which is the Chinese Communist Party, which is still, unlike the imperial regime in, in, in uh, Japan, is still in place. I'd like to see some comparison between what the Japanese did and what the Maoists did during the Great Leap Forward and the, and the Cultural Revolution of, from the 50s into the 1970s. If we could have some candor uh, among Asians about Asia's past, I think that would be a, a really helpful thing. Do I think that will happen? No, I don't. I, there, there's a dynamic I've called uh, attention to, uh, which comes from a silly place uh, out of out of moviedom. If you think about the if you think about the the old movie Animal House, at one point at the beginning of that, uh, the, the two fraternity leaders are watching watching this ROTC officer Niedermeyer, who's a real jerk, abuse a couple of their pledges. You're a goddamn disgrace! A vicious mother, isn't he? Yeah. And they say you can't do that to our pledges. Only we can do that to our pledges. That's kind of the dynamic that you get with the Chinese. It, it, it's uniquely bad for somebody off the continent of Asia to come into your country and abuse your, abuse your people, while at the same time you, you kind of write a free pass to the, to the regime that actually abuses Chinese people in a lot bigger numbers over the 20th century. Frankly, the primary area of conflict, if you will, in East China Sea is nationalism on both sides. Nationalism is on the rise in many places, not least China. Nationalism in, in China uh, is to some extent, like other countries, uh, just patriotism, where countries want their governments to defend uh, their interests. But in China, there is a unique aspect to it. And that nationalism is built around the concept of the century of national humiliation. The center of humiliation. The hundred years of humiliation. Western powers dominated and humiliated China for over a hundred years. China was very weak between 1850 and roughly 1950. And during that hundred year period, it was taken advantage of by the European great powers, by the Americans through the open door policy, and certainly by the Japanese during World War II. It was really ugly. The Chinese suffered greatly. It is very much part of the educational system. Um, this is particularly true of uh, the Japanese element, uh, where students are taught from a very young age about the horrors that uh, uh, Japan uh, committed in, in China. If you o turn on the television in China, you will see every single day there are anti-Japanese uh, TV programs. And that century of national humiliation is being put up in bright lights. And every Chinese person from the bottom of the society to the top of the society focuses in on what happened during that hundred year period. Anytime you mention the Japanese, anytime you mention the Americans, uh, there is the external threat, and that stimulates a nationalist uh, impulse, emotional impulse. This has terribly negative ramifications in the foreign policy realm, because you're basically value infusing the Chinese people to think about their past problems that were the result of the behaviors of countries like Japan and the United States, which are rivals today. So should a crisis break out in the East China Sea with China faced against Japan and the United States, nationalism is going to come racing to the fore and Chinese people and Chinese leaders are going to see Japan and the United States in terms of that century of national humiliation. And this is going to make them very angry. It's going to make them unwilling to compromise. And it's going to significantly increase the possibility that a crisis will escalate. For a very long time, as we all know, China was driven by ideology, certainly through the Mao Zedong period, and then uh, even Deng Xiaoping, uh, 
uh, who was trying to encourage entrepreneurial activity. Zhang Jimin, other leaders, have had to be very sensitive to the party and its ideological, its theology, really. But that has begun to fade. And so the party is struggling for ways of ensuring its coherence and its relevance going forward. And the way it's doing this is to stimulate nationalist challenges. Walking along here with the protesters outside the Japanese embassy, there are thousands of people here on the streets. And so, yes, the Chinese government does stoke nationalism, in part because this is a government in China that is not democratically elected. Um, it obviously is the Chinese Communist Party uh, that is chosen through a very complex party uh, mechanism. Uh, but this is not a party that has uh, very strong legitimacy. And there's a great deal of insecurity at the top that the Chinese people uh, might turn against the government if the Chinese government is not and party is not defending uh, Chinese interests and particularly its, uh, its territory. Xi Jinping is sort of hooking his cart to the, um, the horse team of nationalism and trying to increase his own legitimacy by appealing to the deeply felt resentment, particularly of Japan, uh, but secondarily uh, the United States and uh, some of its neighbors. And so he's trying to increase his own strength within the political system by boosting nationalism. So what do you do? You press the nationalism button. You create an external threat or challenge. You shift the conversation and the anxiety to a different realm. And that's what's going on. That's why this business with the Japanese is so serious and so dangerous, because you can easily find yourself uh, going a step too far. This is a two-edged sword because if, if the Chinese people conclude that he is not sufficiently strong against Japan and compromises, these people can then begin to turning their attention to why was their own government not sufficiently, um, uh, have su sufficient spine or backbone to, to push China's interests. That makes it more difficult to back down from uh, any sort of uh, rational resolution of conflict. And then it becomes difficult to control them uh, because the Chinese government, if they seek to compromise with other countries down the road on these disputed territories, they will run the risk of being seen by their domestic population of selling out Chinese interests unless they are able to explain that what they are doing ultimately serves Chinese interests. So you're kind of unleashing a, an aggressive impulse here, and we've already seen anti-Japanese nationalism spill out into the destruction of Japanese property. So should a crisis break out in the East China Sea with China faced against Japan and the United States, nationalism is going to come racing to the fore and Chinese people and Chinese leaders are going to see Japan and the United States in terms of that century of national humiliation. And this is gonna make them very angry, it's gonna make them unwilling to compromise, and it's gonna significantly increase the possibility that a crisis will escalate. One of the important things to think about in this connection is that if there were to be a conflict between Japan and China, Japan, which has actually a quite capable military, may actually be able to prevail in the initial stages. Japan is still the third largest economy in the world, and frankly, our navy is probably better than the Chinese right now, certainly more efficient. Now, it would be politically impossible for China to lose a fight with Japan, so it's probable that China would then resort to its most destructive weapons, its nuclear weapons. So a dispute between China and Japan might not stay conventional. This is important because the detonation of an another nuclear weapon be the first since 1945, would completely not only destabilize the geopolitics of the world, but also its global economy. This is an incident where it would just change everything we knew about our way of life in an instant. And so we now find ourselves in an increasingly precarious situation where both China and Japan are rapidly arming 
amidst rising nationalism in both countries. But just what exactly might be the specific trigger for what would be a third Sino-Japanese war in little more than a century? The most likely answer lies in a longitude of 123 degrees east and a latitude of 25 degrees north amidst five small islands in the East China Sea that the Japanese call the Senkakus and the Chinese claim as the Daoyu. The validity of either China's or Japan's claims over the Senkaku or the Daoyu Islands, I find it hard to discern where validity in the claims lay. The sovereignty narratives go something like this in terms of legal references, right? The Chinese go back to the Ming Dynasty, right? There is the troubling habit of the Chinese to claim that wherever Chinese pottery is found, then in that case, that presumably was once part of Chinese territory. They locate these islands as part of what we know as Formosa in the pre-war period, Taiwan today. They say that that was all China. So they have a pre-modern argument for the territorial sovereignty claim. China didn't claim it for a long time. Now that there's oil and gas, now that there are stakes that are security related in terms of choke point access, suddenly China is very adamant on an expansive claim. For the Japanese, they go back to an entrepreneur, uh, Mr. Koga, who had been uh, in Okinawa, who had been in Kyushu and then moved to Okinawa and was trying to make his fortune in the world. And he was exploring offshore islands and he went out to explore and then petitioned the Meiji government to declare sovereignty, that there were, this is where the Terra Nullius, which is no one lives here, there's no signs of a claim here, nobody seems to want these islands, they're just sitting here and we should, take, we should claim them for Japan. It coincided within a month, a year, uh, the formal uh, declaration by the Meiji government of claiming those islands with the end of the, the First Sino-Japanese War. So in Taiwan and in China, you'll get lots of people who say, aha, sneaky Japanese. <laughs> Whatever those arguments, the fact is that uh, the status quo uh, is uh, stable, provided that everyone accepts it. And the only way to change it at this point, the only way for China to change it, is through threats or through the use of force. And that's extremely dangerous for China as for everybody else. There's a serious precedent that could be set by letting the Senkakus go. For example, there was a big conference in, uh, in China last year of scholars, pretty eminent people, who got together and contended that uh, the Ryukyus also fall into that same category and that these are rightful Chinese territory, if you, if you look at history the correct way. Already, we are hearing Chinese policymakers backed up by Chinese state media, arguing that Beijing should lay a claim to Okinawa and the rest of the Ryukyu chain as well. The Ryukyu's uh, island chain used to be an independent kingdom and was a, tributary of, was a tributary state of China. In other words, it had a long-running relationship with China uh, dating back uh, into, dynastic, into the dynastic era. And so what that means is that there is a real sense of insecurity on the part of the Japanese that the Ryukyus could potentially be up for grabs as, as well. So my, my guess is that this is certainly not an immediate prospect, but nonetheless something that worries the Japanese who, uh, who fear losing control of occupied territory that's, uh, that's down to their south. People actually live there and, all, and have done for, for many centuries. So this is something they worry about. Uh, and so I think that whole entire southern part of the uh, Japan's uh, strategic front is something that worries Tokyo very much. And so even if, even if we assume, even if we accept that the United States uh, has no geostrategic stake in Taiwan or the Ryukyu Island chain, the fact that our most important ally in the region cares suggests that we should take a closer look as well. And if we do take that closer look, just what will we find in the annals of history and the canons of international law? Both sides have legal claims. If you were going to adjudicate this under international law, you would go to the International Court of Justice, which is a UN-based uh, global court, if you will. It would be wonderful if China would agree to go to international court or Japan would push China to go to international court. But in the circumstances, that's not realistic because it, it's seen on both sides as a concession. Japan says, look, we have, we're, we have full administrative control of these islands and furthermore, they're ours. Why should we go to an international court to prove that? That would undermine the fact that we're saying it's ours and that we control it. And China 
doesn't even trust international courts to begin with. You can look at the Philippines case. China believes that those courts, although it's part of the international system in the UN, are mostly serving um, with regard to Western interests. China doesn't feel that its interests will be respected. Who would win this case? Well, again, I'm not an international lawyer, but the first piece of the puzzle is that ICJ uh, uses modern history. So it would be based on the Taiwanese and the Japanese claims of the 1890s. It would not go back and recognize Ming history. Uh, it only recognizes modern Westphalian law. Um, and so who would win? Hard to know. Uh, I think I, I've talked to international legal experts who think the Japanese have a great case. But this dispute has no real substance to it. Uh, I think if it were taken to the international uh, courts, uh, Japan would come out the winner. I don't think China wants that to happen. I've talked to others who think, mm, not so clear. So I think we'd have to watch the tribunal, but I think the evidence that would be brought to bear would be, in fact, very similar. Um, and I think the Japanese, the fact of the matter is the Japanese inhabited those islands. There were living human beings, Japanese citizens, recognized by the state as Japanese citizens, who lived on that island all the way up until the early 1930s when it became very, very hard to sustain you know, communication between the, the Senkakus and Ishigaki. The fact is that if every country in the world wanted to reopen territorial disputes that extend back into the 19th century, uh, we would not have a peaceful and stable world. It makes no sense, uh, even if there were, in some sense, a legitimate claim on the part of the Chinese, reopening this issue uh, can only create tensions and, and difficulties. And that's exactly what we now have, increasing tensions and more and more difficulties, raising this inevitable question. Are the Senkaku Dayu Islands really worthless rocks in the sea, as some claim? Or do they have enough strategic and economic value to make them worth fighting for? These islands between China and Japan are really rather uh, unimportant to the U.S. national interest. It's commonplace not only in places like Beijing, but also among uh, Western commentators to describe the Senkaku Islands just as a bunch of uninhabited rocks. In Clausewitzian terms, who in the world would undertake an expensive, per perhaps protracted military effort in order to defend these worthless rocks? They're not important to Japan. They're not important to China. They're not important. They're certainly not important to the United States. It is simply not credible under any conceivable circumstance to assume that the United States would take high-risk actions with the potential to escalate to unacceptable levels over unoccupied bits of rock in the East China Sea. Intuitively, that sounds right, doesn't it? They, they're not inhabited, they don't have water, they can't sustain economic t activity or, or any of these other things. But at the same time, I think what China is attempting to do is to, to try to create a precedent that they can modify the international legal order, the order that's been in place under the United States leadership for the last 70 years. Uh, if the United States permits China to unilaterally change the rules of the game, then it may have a harder, it may have a harder time uh, pushing back effectively against that in the future. I think that's one reason the Japanese have uh, cast so much uh, importance on what happened in Crimea, because they see that as a similar effort to change the rules of the game by Russia, and that this might have sort of a contagion effect of, into East Asia to their detriment. But it may be far more than rules and principles that China and Japan are really fighting over. Key valuable resources also come into play, along with perhaps the very ability of an increasingly fearful Japan to defend its own coastline and homeland. These islands uh, sit atop uh, large undersea reservoirs of gas and oil, and are both are coveted by Japan and China. Those are rocks. They're not important to anyone. The Senkaku Islands are both rocks in the sea and very important. <laughs> and herein lies the controversy. We look at it, we, show, we see these pictures of these clumps of rocks, and we think, why should we care, right? But here's the point. The UN law of the sea, right? denotes ex exclusive economic zones 200 nautical miles out from land features. And just why are these exclusive economic zones so important? An exclusive economic zone then gives a country access to the resources, the maritime resources, right? So those are, uh, those are resources in the water, so marine resources, fisheries, right? We all eat and love fish, so that's, that's an important resource. That it's, it's, we shouldn't un underestimate the impact of that, right? Seabed, 
what's under the seabed is also exclusively available to the, the, the coastal state. So the competition in the East China Sea today, we, we get very focused on these islands and especially the historical narrative about whose islands they were and what they mean for popular sovereignty, right? But underneath it, if you look at the geography, those islands sit on the very edge of the continental shelf that China claims ought to be the basis for its exclusive economic zone. And it may be here where we discover the real underlying tensions between China and Japan over what do indeed appear at first glance to be worthless rocks in the East China Sea. Now between Japan and China, the East China Sea is about 360, 65 nautical miles across. Thus you can't have both countries having 200 nautical mile zones. They have to have some negotiated compromise about where their maritime boundary is. And that's the undercurrent of this island dispute that people don't actually recognize, is that on, these islands sit on top of an of a under uh, a seabed land feature that the Chinese think ought to be theirs. So if, you, if, if China is right, or let's just say if Chinese claims are recognized, then from the Senkakus outwards, they get to claim 200 nautical miles. Well, 200 nautical miles brings you smack right up into the territorial waters of Japan, right? <laughs> so 12 nautical miles now is territorial waters, so nobody's going to give them an EEZ within territorial waters. But that's a problem. It is indeed a problem if China is allowed to claim economic resources like fish and petroleum right up to the territorial limit of Japan. So it's no wonder there is growing conflict over control of the Senkaku Dayu Islands. But what happens if China actually invades the islands? Let's see what our experts have to say about this next clue and question. The U.S.-Japan Mutual Security Treaty recognizes that islands or territories that are under Japan's administrative control are also covered by the treaty so that if they were attacked, the United States would be obligated to respond. And the United States has said recently that they are willing to defend Japan should China attack Japan uh, over these islands. As a matter of American policy, we do not take a position which country has sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands, Japan or China. We do insist, however, that those disputes be settled peacefully. Unfortunately, China is using forceful means to try to pry the Senkakus from Japan. The question of whether or not the United States would go to war to defend these allies, I think is pretty clear. I think they would. Absolutely, we have a treaty commitment. That commitment didn't start in 2010 with the trawler incident or 2012 with the purchase of the islands. It began in 1960 when we revised our treaty with Japan. And we announced at that time that we were committed to the defense of Japan and to all territories under the administration of Japan. So do we go to war with the Senkakus or not? And it'll depend a lot upon how China does this. If China starts the war by sink a carrier, we're probably in because we don't respond well to sneak attacks or killing large numbers of Americans. If you were summoned to the White House after China basically took the Senkaku Islands by amphibious landing, what would you tell the president to do in terms of J Japanese interests at that point? The United States has consistently said, under multiple administrations, that the U.S.-Japan mutual security uh, relationship covers the Senkakus because those islands are under the administrative control of Japan. And I believe that, as with other treaty commitments, any decision to walk away from that commitment will have devastating consequences. So for the United States, we might see a crisis, uh, the use of force by China against the Philippines or against Japan, as a test of U.S. alliances as a test of American credibility in the region. And so the United States is not likely to stand by and do nothing. Because if we do not respond in these kind of crises, it will be a signal to the region that we are an unreliable ally, an unreliable partner. And it might also be a signal to China that it can push further um, and it can take advantage of opportunities and maybe not have to worry about the United States intervening. If we were to abandon Japan, we would essentially start a process that could end up with the U.S. being excluded from trade and investment in Asia. And that would be critical because that is an important part of the world.
So if I were to be asked to the White House to talk to the chief executive, whoever that was, um, in a situation where the Chinese have seized uh, the Senkakus, I would be advising the president that he m must stand firm with Tokyo, make very clear to Beijing that this would not be allowed to stand, and to extend support, including weapons, including American forces, to the aid of the self-defense forces in retaking those islands. If they actually land on the Senkakus, then we have two options. We can try to take it back with physical force and amphibious landing, or we can make the, the islands unusable. And there are plenty of modern weapons, thermobaric weapons, that could make those very small islands unusable for human habitation. What's a thermobaric weapon? A thermobaric weapon is a weapon that spreads a fuel air uh, mixture. It, it, it disseminates fuel air all the way over, and then it detonates. So it goes into the holes in the ground, you, you breathe it in, and then it detonates, and it, by overpressure, kills. The Russians use thermobarics in Chechnya, uh, handheld RPG-type thermobarics. They're a devastating weapon. So China attacks and takes the Senkakus. We wipe out every Chinese soldier on the islands with thermobaric weapons. What happens next? Well, that's the problem. Nationalism will get going. That's why I said there's, there's no accounting for stupidity. Uh, so you have to be prepared to fight. Another option is quarantine. So to the extent that China's been sloppy in its preparation of how to route in supplies for a small contingent it might place on the Diyu Islands, maybe we decide that, you know, um, we'll give them water and a little bit of, of rice, but otherwise nobody's getting into that island. We have an aircraft carrier, right? It's deployed out of, it's home ported in Japan. We have F-22s now in Naha. We have, in addition to our, our other aircraft, right, fighter aircraft, we have considerable military forces in Japan itself. And now that is dangerous because then China's going to be tempted to try to break that blockade. And so I actually think there's an argument, if you get to this ugly scenario, to just do economic sanctions first and maybe some military base uh, augmentation in the region and try to give China some time to rethink what it just did and maybe find a peaceful way out. But it may be hard to find any such peaceful way out in a world in which the options now being discussed already provocatively range from sanctions on the world's largest economy and island quarantines to a deadly attack on Chinese forces, which is why at least some of our experts recommend pulling the plug on America's commitments to Japan. What the hell are we over there guaranteeing the Japanese rights to these islands that we have no interest in and saying we'll go to war with China if China tried to invade those islands? I think it's madness. I mean, why is that important to Americans living up in Schenectady, New York? Uh, they want jobs. That's what our country should be focused on, and that's what we should be trying to do. If indeed those rocks have become the basis for a major turn in U.S. national security policy, which is what I perceive happening, uh, maybe not just those rocks, but also the rocks in the South China Sea, so more rocks, uh, that's irrational. Irrational or not, it is increasingly clear that things could indeed spin out of control in the East China Sea, if not by strategic design, then simply by accident, incident, or miscalculation. Which leads us to our final question and clue in this episode. The territorial dispute between Japan and China has made many Americans worried that our alliance commitment to Japan is going to drag us into a conflict with China. It is possible to imagine those two countries, China and Japan, actually ending up in a shooting match over a bunch of rocks in the East China Sea. How can this possibly be? Because it would threaten the economic prosperity of both countries. It would have all sorts of negative economic consequences. But the fact is, from the Chinese point of view and the Japanese point of view, these rocks are sacred territory. Now, it would be politically impossible for China to lose a fight with Japan. So it's probable that China would then resort to its most destructive weapons, its nuclear weapons. So a dispute between China and Japan might not stay conventional. China decides, for example, that 
Um, it can take the Senkakus, and Japan is too weak, and the United States is too weak, or else the United States is, will not honor its treaty obligation with Japan, um, or the United States will find itself too occupied with other things in order to support the Japanese. And so the Chinese decide, okay, now we're going to do it. And it turns out they're wrong, um, that Japan defends itself vigorously, calls on the United States, on its treaty, United States to honor its treaty obligations. The United States honors its treaty obligations in the expectation that it can contain the conflict over the Senkakus in, and resolve it in favor of Japan, but the calculation is wrong and, it, and the war widens. That is much more likely than a conscious decision in Beijing. Today is the day we're going to attack the United States, sort of the way Tokyo did in December of 1941 responsible people need to try to rein in these impulses and realize what the uh, what real issues are uh, real threats genuine threats to our countries and they do not involve rocks uh, in any respect so the issue is how do we manage to live together how do we manage to to reduce the risks on the ground which could see a small accident or incident escalated into something that neither side wants for obvious reasons economic interdependence just being one of them. Um, because it's that type of accident that could do it. It's, so people say, oh, the world's you know, number two and three economies will never go to war. Well, how many wars were really deliberately started with an intent to go to full world war?